Hello everyone and welcome back. Um, this is already the 12th episode of our Digital Trader Summit series and uh, very happy that this one will be again centered around yeah, emission markets. Uh, it's not the first time. We had already two sessions where we touched upon uh, pricing trends and emissions um, from a technical perspective or fundamental perspective. And uh, in preparation for this session, I got asked by, by some participants again, why are you dealing with emissions? You, you can't trade and, uh, emissions on NMAC yet. And that's right, but I personally believe that it's really uh, one of the defining markets um, for the next 20, 30 years to come. And uh, just that the fact that you can't trade it yet on NMAC doesn't mean that this stays like that in the future. So, so much I can say. Um, and we'll tackle the topic from a different angle this time. So I'm very happy to have Julia Elmgren with us. Uh, she's leading the team for environmental products at Gazprom, and uh, she will take us through the big picture and show us the bigger trends on a global scale. Um, I am, again, super excited to learn more about the topic, and uh, I'm really looking forward to the session. Julia, thanks for joining us, and uh, I directly hand over to you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jens. Thanks a lot. Is it? Can I just check? Is my screen shared? No, we see no. it. No, okay. <laughs> then I shall share it. Um, Perfect. But, uh, but yeah, thanks for that uh, introduction. I mean, th this is a hugely uh, interesting topic for me as well. I mean, I originally trained as a, um, a marine biologist, um, and I, I used to be at least a, a keen diver, and I, I have a great uh, interest in, in nature and, and generally speaking, um, you know, uh, biodiversity, etc. So I think it's, um, you know, now obviously working on it from a sort of commercial point of view, it sort of ties it all nicely into um, um, in together. Um, so I, I will a bit later on, uh, touch upon specifically the EU ETS, which I think, um, you know, a lot of us are interested in, and we see headlines on it, etc. But I before we do that, I just want to, as Jens said, um, talk a bit about the bigger picture, because I think it's really useful to to not lose sight of what all these numbers mean, and uh, you know where we actually need to get to in order to um, uh, to keep you know climate change under control. Yeah. Um, one, one last comment, maybe for my side, because I forgot it. Uh, as always, I would really encourage everyone participating in the call to to uh, send us questions uh, during your presentation. I will try to gather them at the end, so we have a very good discussion afterwards. Uh, so please use the, the functionality of Zoom in, in the bottom, uh, the, the Q&A or the chat function, and I will uh, yeah, take the questions into the discussion with Julia. Thanks. Now, now you're ready. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I, I welcome questions as well. I mean, it's a, I'm going to touch upon a lot of things very briefly. So, so, you know, if you have interest in discussing anything in a bit more detail, definitely uh, we can do that. Um, but to start with, um, I've got um, a slide here on something that a lot of uh, us have seen previously, um, just showing really, you know, uh, over the last hundred or so years, how the, um, you know, increase in CO2 emissions have led to an increase in atmospheric CO2 concentration. Um, and, um, you know, you can see the high correlation here between the two, uh, between the two charts. Um, and, uh, you know, some elements, you know, around this, what we've, what we've been seeing over the last, um, you know, 10, 20, 30 years is, you know, average temperatures have increased um, on average by almost one degree um, in the last 10 or so years versus pre-industrial levels. Um, there's, uh, you know, a huge amount of deforestation um, going on at the moment. I mean, there's an estimated 10 million hectares of uh, forest being cut down every year, which is, I believe, roughly the size of Greece. Um, and that's every year. Um, you know, oceans are getting more acidic. Um, the atmosphere is, is significantly more wetter as well, which is leading to, uh, you know, to more sort of extreme weather, uh, water events and flooding. Um, you know, awful lot of the uh, summer sea ice in the Arctic is gone. Um, you know, potentially leading to, to some huge changes in, in the functioning of, uh, you know, oceanic, uh, uh, you know, flows and, and patterns um, in the seas. Um, and there's, you know, an increasing risk of extinction for species because they simply cannot, you know, adapt quickly enough uh, to, to the changes in temperature and, and other, um, you know, uh, wet, dry uh, weather conditions. Um, you know, 
as I said, you know, there's a lot of extreme weather events just this year. Um, so far, there has been 35 events which have caused damage in excess of a billion dollars. Uh, that's only in the first nine months of the year. Um, and uh, last year, for example, there was, um, I believe, 40 in total for the full year. So we're definitely on track uh, to beating that, um, uh, you know, that amount uh, for 2020. Um, and also today, or yesterday, uh, this morning, I read uh, the NOAA that track these things um, reported that September 20 was the warmest September uh, ever recorded. Um, and so far this year, uh, we're already more than a degree above the 20th century average. Um, so we're well on our way to um, breaking the previous uh, highest uh, year, which was 2016. So um, if we look at, you know, what the actual, um, you know, global emissions look like at the moment um, and, and the kind of the different pathways, we, um, you know, pre-industrially, we were emitting very little uh, in the single digits of gigatons or billions of tons, uh, depending on which, which measure you want to use. Um, you can see, a, a, you know, a steady increase um, to where we are today, where emissions are roughly 35 gigatons uh, per year. Um, and I just want to point out, I've, I've picked a few years here just to, to mention, you know, how we achieved, um, you know, what kind of climate negotiation events happened uh, during the different years. So, so we have, obviously, we started 1990 with um, the Rio conference, which was the real, the first big uh, conference to bring the world's attention to this, this topic. Um, 1997, we had obviously a Kyoto Protocol uh, was signed, and that was, you know, the basis of, um, uh, you know, the, the EUTS, um, uh, you know, CDM, JI mechanisms, and that was really what what kicked off this. And in the meantime, you know, our emissions have kept uh, going up. Um, then, of course, 2009, the very famous uh, failed uh, Copenhagen um, negotiations, uh, where at least they salvaged you know, an ambition to uh, limit temperature increase by two degrees by 2050. And that's actually, you know, uh, a critical element because that is the essence of what was agreed in the Paris Accord in 2015. I mean, the, the wording actually for the Paris Accord is, um, you know, we want to limit the temperature increase to well below two degrees while pursuing efforts to limit increase to one and a half degrees. And so, uh, you know, I, I want to introduce you to the concept of, you know, carbon budget. So um, because of the cumulative nature of greenhouse gas emissions, um, there is, you know, an estimated sort of uh, stock left that we are able to, you know, emit greenhouse gas emissions before we reach, uh, you know, an atmospheric CO2 concentration at a level whereby we would set off some, you know, severe, um, uh, climate uh, climate events so you know if, if we continue on a on a BAU level so the, the top line here um, uh, basically means we we sort of spew out um, from from basically from today onwards we spew out another uh, you know 1200 gigatons and that would see us uh, most likely increasing temperatures by over four degrees by 2050. Uh, and this could see some devastating uh, effects. If we continue with sort of BAU, um, sorry, uh, the, the kind of um, uh, renewable policies and, and for example, the current EUTS policy sees us very much uh, you know, flatlining, maybe reducing annual emissions slightly. Uh, and there the total carbon budget uh, is, um, is, is a thousand uh, gigatons. And then really what um, I want to show you the, the the steep decline that you need to see in order to reach what scientists believe is, you know, the kind of, um, you know, the safest uh, place we can get to, which is limiting the temperature increase to one and a half degrees. So we only have another 400 gigatons left that we can emit by 2050. Um, and that is crazy to think about because at the moment we're emitting 35 gigatons per year. So we've got about 10 years left uh, at you know, current emission levels. And, and obviously, the, you know, the longer you take to implement um, emission reductions, 
um, you know, the steeper it has to get at, at, at the back. Um, and, um, and this graph actually looks very similar to the, uh, uh, to the 60% target under the EUTS, which, which I'll, I'll show you in a second. Um, just um, briefly, just to, to give you an idea of, of the current carbon pricing initiatives we see around the world, this is a, a really nice uh, slide from the World Bank State of the, the Carbon Markets Report from 2020. Uh, that gives a really nice overview. Um, uh, they re release this every year. Um, and, and here you can see, you know, uh, the different colors are, you know, uh, emissions trading schemes or taxes uh, at different levels of, of implementation, but there's quite a good coverage um, across the world. Um, you know, the yellow ones, for example, Brazil, uh, there's, uh, there's some schemes under consideration. Uh, but, but the thing really to, to note here is um, that these schemes only cover 12 gigatons of CO2. Um, and that's just simply not enough, um, it, you know, if we want to reach our, our Paris Agreement um, ambitions. Uh, and in the blue boxes, you've got the, um, uh, the different price levels um, that you see, uh, you know, in, in uh, California, for example, seventeen dollars. Um, that's where it was yesterday. Anyway, I presume it's somewhere uh, in the same region still. Um, EUTS, obviously, twenty-five euros there or thereabouts. Um, and then you have the tax schemes in South Africa and Colombia that are, you know, significantly lower. And the question really is: is do these low prices um, actually incentivize uh, significant emission reductions? So um, if we're looking at then, so the Paris Agreement and, and what have countries actually uh, pledged, um, I mentioned what the, the goal of, of Paris is, which, um, which we all know, but, uh, but the important thing um, with the Paris Agreement, which is different from Kyoto, is that um, under Kyoto, the world was split into um, developed and developing countries, uh, whereas under the Paris Agreement, every signatory uh, is required to put forward a nationally determined contribution uh, on how they plan to uh, you know adhere to uh, the Paris goals um, and they need to strengthen these on a regular basis and there's also a global stock take um, every five years so so really you're relying on the kind of the the uh, the force of international bullying uh, to uh, you know, to get to get countries to um, submit strict uh, NDCs. And another interesting thing with the Paris Agreement, uh, we obviously had that under Kyoto as well, is uh, the international trading and cooperation between, uh, between parties. And this is Article 6, which you will have heard of um, uh, in the press. Uh, it's, it's not yet uh, agreed. It's a uh, you know, hugely contentious topic uh, given uh, you know, some of the history in, in CDM uh, uh, etc. Some, some countries want to include, uh, you know, historic emission reductions. Uh, uh, you know, most parties are, are strongly against that. But, uh, but I, would, uh, I would point you to, uh, again, an excellent website, Climate Action Tracker, which they summarize all the different NDCs um, that are submitted by the parties of Kyoto, uh, sorry, <laughs> parties of Paris. Uh, agreement, and I've just taken a little snapshot here of um, uh, of you know a, a few parties uh, and what which kind of climate uh, uh, temperature increase target their ambitions are compatible with. And you know if we if we start on the um, on the gray side of the scale, uh, you've got um, uh, obviously the USA um, are you know they they are actually at the moment they are going to exit the Paris Agreement the day after the, uh, the US election. So, so that's going to be an interesting uh, development um, you know, if, if Biden does get uh, elected. Um, the US uh, will stay in the Paris Agreement. Um, and he has, he has indicated you know, uh, lots of very ambitious uh, policies. Uh, for example, um, putting a tax on the border, similar to what the EU are planning. Um, and they are talking about a so-called well-mouth tax, uh, where they want to tax uh, coal, gas, and oil as it comes out of the ground, um, and this is, you know, obviously um, massively different from the the stance of the of the current administration. And then I thought I just I 
I preempt probably the the attack on on Russian emissions by just putting Russia up there. Uh, I don't deny that um, you know uh, Russia's climate ambitions are are fairly low at the moment. Um, you know there was a, a climate legislation that was proposed 2018, which has subsequently been completely dropped, uh, and there is consistently a very low renewable uptake uh, in Russia. Um, and China is you know also very very interesting one uh, just to touch upon. Um, their ambition currently, so despite having um, announced uh, the target to become carbon neutral by 2060, which you would have seen uh, over the last couple of weeks, um, as per climate action tracker, they still rate that as highly insufficient um, because China is still promoting uh, its coal industry. Um, so, so despite, I think with, with China, uh, you have to remember that uh, China's emissions are nearly 10 gigatons per year. So that is a huge chunk of the sort of the global budget that we have left. So unless China takes, you know, very steep cuts very soon, um, you know, we, we run out of budget effectively. Um, and then we've got the EU. So it's, it's currently in the in the insufficient bracket because uh, uh, this is assuming the existing targets, which are in law, so 40% reduction by 2030. And um, just to note, you know, the, the countries that are actually compatible with the Paris Agreement at the moment, there's only two of them, uh, Morocco and Gambia. And, and those two don't contribute an awful lot of emissions uh, per year at all. But uh, if we, uh, yeah, with that all in mind, let's move on to the EU um, and the EU's policies. <clears throat> We've got, um, so at the, the, the current climate and energy framework sees us cutting um, emissions by 40% uh, by 2030 versus 1990 levels um, and a 32% share of renewable energy um, and also an, an increase in, in energy efficiency. And these are targets that we're more or less, uh, you know, uh, about to achieve, um, including, for example, 20% by 2020, uh, which will be achieved this year uh, on greenhouse gas emissions cuts. Um, and of course, the biggest uh, topic in the EU at the moment is the uh, Green Deal, which was announced at the end of 2019. And that's really the basis of, of EU's efforts to try to uh, align itself with the Paris, uh, Paris targets. So um, the proposal, as it was tabled uh, end of last year, uh, uh, talked about reducing emissions by at least 55%. Um, and as we, we saw um, last week, or was it the week before, uh, Parliament voted for um, a 60% cut by 2030. Um, and interestingly also, what the Parliament passed in its position was um, they want carbon neutrality by 2050 to apply to each individual member state as well. Also, you know, obviously to the EU as a collective, but also individual member states have to adhere to this. Um, and uh, they rejected the use of international offsets as well. So if there was any, any hope of uh, CDM making a comeback into Europe, that, that's not happening anytime soon. Um, and then we've got, so COP26 is, is the next um, international kind of talk coming up and that's um, you know being led by the EU. The EU has always been very uh, very big on the international stage and this is where we hope um, next year that we will see some conclusion to the to the article six that I mentioned. Um, other key legislations um, we've got obviously the UTS which I've, I've got a few more slides on. Um, there are national targets being made for other sectors for example in, in Germany uh, we have um, uh, emissions from uh, transport and uh, heating, which are going to be covered by init you know, initially a fixed, um, a fixed fee per ton uh, starting next year, and that's going to go incrementally up um, until 2025. Um, so that's moving in the right uh, direction. There's also a lot of effort, obviously, to, to reduce emissions from transport, which in the EU account for roughly um, a quarter of emissions, actually. Uh, there's the promotion of low carbon technologies, namely hydrogen is, is one, uh, one big topic. And, um, and I just wanted to mention as well the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Um, this is um, a very hot topic at the moment. There's a, 
an ongoing consultation um, with regards to this. Um, you know, obviously, the, the, the point of the carbon border adjustment mechanism is that as prices increase in the EU, um, we want to, uh, you know, put a border tax in place that we reduce leakage um, and effectively raising the level playing field um, with, you know, within countries, countries around the world. Um, the uh, sectors which are initially going to be covered uh, seem to be steel, cement and electricity. Um, I actually watched a, a really interesting panel on Politico uh, last night where um, uh, a cabinet member from, from Franz Timmermans cabinet was, was there talking, talking about exactly the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Um, and um, yeah, he, he's, he, you know, very much for uh, the implementation of it. They're, they're very aware, obviously, of the, of the WTO issues, potentially. Um, but he was adamant that it was going to get implemented before 2023. Um, and, uh, and they're clearly not limiting themselves to those first three initial sectors, but they want to uh, you know, want to include aluminium and chemicals in, in sort of a next uh, phase uh, on, the, on that mechanism. But it is really one of the key elements um, for the, uh, you know, in order for the EUTS to actually work sufficiently. Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll move on to the EU ETS now. Um, you know, there's been a lot of headlines over the last couple of weeks. We know um, Germany, the the current uh, current presidents, you know, they they want to have cli the climate law in place by the end of the year. Um, they have so far supported fifty five percent, and that seems to be the council's position, um, whereas uh, Parliament uh, are supporting sixty percent. And I I've I've put up here sixty uh, percent as my kind of Paris. Um, uh, line um, because I mean fifty five percent and sixty percent don't make a massive difference, but I I think it's just interesting to see literally the effects of, of the sixty percent, which is which is what Parliament wants. So if we if we look first at the blue line, so so this is the um, the current projected balance of uh, the EU ETS. This is including all the current existing rules, um, uh, the current functioning of the MSR. Uh, the 40 percent target by 2030 um, and with a 2.2 percent linear reduction factor uh, year on year and here you can see like the uh, the blue line so the the balance in the eu ets never actually drops uh even close to zero because there's still quite a big excess from uh from the previous uh phase um but really quite drastically um when you uh when you put in the numbers for a 60 percent target reduction um, you know what's what's key here is um, the linear reduction factor has to go up so drastically um, in order to reach um, you know the, the the 2030 cap, which needs to be less than a billion tons by 2030. Current emissions, for, so emissions in 2019 were 1.6 billion. So over 10 years, we've got to cut off 600 million tons. That's the equivalent of you know the entire power sector. At the moment, um, so it's it's clearly you know a huge uh, huge chunk that that has to go, and I I have in these numbers projected a two percent year on year emission reduction, and uh, and even with that there's you know so much more that has to be done, and what's what's really interesting is uh, because we still have some excess EUAs left um, from you know previous uh, from the previous phase. At the moment, the estimate is about 1.4 billion tons of, of sort of, we call it the total number of allowances in circulation, the TANAC. Um, that number is still so high that despite the, you know, Paris targets going into force, um, because the TANAC is still so high, the, um, the MSR still keeps withdrawing EUAs from the auctioning volumes every year. And that's why we see this really drastic uh, reduction in the balance uh, in 2022 and 2023. Um, then from 24, 25 onwards, actually the uh, the TANAC goes sort of below the withdrawal threshold, um, and and the MSR doesn't withdraw anymore. But by that point, the you know the overall cap is so tight 
um, that you know we're already at a negative balance, uh, you know, within within five years. And here I've got a um, very plain um, year by year view of the supply demand balance in the EU ETS. So the blue line is total emissions, again, 2% annual uh, reduction. Um, and then the bars is the, so the light bar is the current supply and the blue bar is the, uh, the Paris target supply. So this is the 60%. Um, and here is just, again, what I, what I was pointing out in, in the previous slide, you can see the massive gap between emissions um, and the Paris target supply. And, and the big difference here is, is, is the 60% target means that there is a constant deficit between emissions and supply. Whereas under you know, the current rules, you have those three years in 25, 26, 27, um, when you know, the whole system sort of relaxes again. Uh, and that's what uh, needs to be changed, obviously, in order to you know, give the right uh, incentives to the market. If we look at um, specifically at the different sectors uh, in the EU ETS, this is uh, it's also very, very interesting to, to think about um, how the different sectors are behaving. I mean, uh, the main ones that are, you know, directly, um, uh, you know, affected by the EU ETS, obviously, is the in industrial sector and the power sector. And in the, uh, the graph on the right, um, I've got my very basic, um, uh, projection of utility hedging, which is the um, the blue bars, and that's my assumption of uh, of a very basic. So front year is fully hedged, year plus one fifty percent hedged, year plus two is twenty five percent hedged. Um, and here you can see that even with a decline in thermal um, production numbers, uh, as we project going forward, the demand from utilities um, stays. Uh, you know, north of 1 billion tons, you know, well into the decade. Um, and in the meantime, the, the orange bars, which is the actual number of allowances available in circulation, very quickly drops below what even just the utility sector would need to hedge. So we're looking at a scenario where already in 2023, 2024, um, there is simply not enough EUAs around even just to satisfy utility hedging. So, you know, how, you know, are, are they gonna, you know, hedge less? Uh, we don't know, but, but, um, but that's, you know, very stark numbers uh, staring at you when you, when you analyze the, um, uh, the 60% uh, target. And then in the, the other graph in the bottom left is uh, just a snapshot on the industry so the industrial sector historically in the UTS has received uh, most of its allocation for free. And going forward, um, that's going to reduce um, you know, in line with the, the Paris uh, target uh, cap. And, and you can see again, um, you know, the, the free allocation goes down um, in line with the linear reduction factor significantly quicker than the projected 2% uh, year on year uh, reduction. And then, I mean, the, the, the third uh, group of uh, participants is the speculators and, um, and they are you know, quite an unknown bunch. I and mean, we saw what they did to the market in 2018. Um, there's certainly you know, several, um, several parties still involved um, on the speculative side. And more and more funds getting involved, and they could, you know, add even further pressure on top of the already very tight um, scenarios uh, for both utilities and and industrials. Um, and I think really the the question we need to ask ourselves, which by the way I don't have the answer to, uh, is you know what price do we need to get to um, so that we actually achieve emissions abatement? Because that's what we're going towards here. You know, we we can very clearly see we need to see hundreds of millions being cut um, every year. And, um, you know, there was a, on, on the same Politico panel I watched yesterday, the chairman for ArcelorMittal was, was on there. Um, and, you know, he was very candid about, you know, that they have set their own uh, net zero targets, I believe. 
Um, but, uh, you know, he just wants a level playing field. You know, they're very willing to, uh, you know, implement uh, carbon emissions uh, technologies, uh, reduction technologies, um, but, uh, but they can't be doing it on their own. Um, so he was effectively promoting the, the, the carbon border adjustment mechanism. But, um, you know, we have, we've seen numbers between 40 euros to up to 70 euros plus if we're talking about hydrogen based technologies and and this is really um, the kind of levels that we're talking of, of of what we need to reach and then just moving on slightly just to kind of um, you know wrap up a little bit uh, moving away from from the EUTS to um, other emissions what about the emissions that aren't covered by um, uh, by the EUTS, and and this is this is by the way the case for most global um, trading schemes and taxes at the moment. Uh, they mainly cover um, the power sectors and industrial sectors. So, if you look at the overall global emissions share, um, take these numbers a little bit with a pinch of salt because this is um, I've taken this data from various uh, sources, and obviously it varies a lot by by location as well. But um, you know, power sector is is obviously the the biggest share of global emissions. Um, but, um, but other large contributors are, for example, the building sector. Um, and what I mentioned before is, is there's the German ETS coming there, obviously. Um, uh, and there's a big drive to, uh, you know, improve efficiencies in buildings and, and generally speaking, you know, uh, electrify them. Uh, then we've got uh, forestry, you know, contributes 15% uh, to the global emissions share, you know, how do we how do we stop that uh, defore deforestation from happening? Um, road transport, which I mentioned um, already uh, before, um, again, it's going to be covered by the by the uh, German uh, ETS, um, and you know we're seeing a lot of policies promoting you know electric vehicles at the moment. For example, I mean, in, in the UK, I believe after 2035, you cannot even even buy uh, a car with a you know, normal combustion engine anymore. Uh, so that's obviously a huge sector which still needs to be tackled. And, and one I think which is sometimes a bit surprising to people is agriculture. Um, I, I saw on some websites that if all cows were a country, they would actually have the same emissions as the USA, which is quite astonishing. So that's about six gigatons. Uh, just all the cows in the world, um, and so there, there's huge changes that that you know we we need to see in in that sector. Um, and then I've mentioned obviously renewables, hydrogen, um, and in manufacturing, you know, uh, changing some of these you know, very old uh, and inefficient processes, uh, particularly I guess in the steel and uh, and cement sector. And so my final slide is on, um, you know, the, the consumer. And I think this is, this is a point which, which, is, which is what I think has really changed over the last, let's say, 10 years. Um, you know, 20 years ago, it was just, I mean, when I grew up, I didn't, no one taught me about recycling or I, there was no electric cars on the roads, et cetera. And now you cannot go by a single day without reading about some climate change event. And, you know, for example, my, my son came back from school the other day and they had watched, um, you know, the latest David Attenborough documentary on Netflix, for example. I hugely recommend everyone to watch that. It's, it's a very, very sobering one. Um, you know, they, they do projects on recycling, et cetera. So public opinion is, you know, really, really uh, behind this now. And so you're seeing a lot of companies now you know, they're, they're looking at um, reducing their, not just their direct emissions, but also um, supply chain emissions. And we've got a lot of different kind of initiatives um, aiming to sort of set some sort of standards around this. So we've got the science-based targets um, and the climate pledge, for example, um, which is supported by, that, by, uh, by Amazon. Um, and just to mention as well, principles for responsible investment. Uh, I mean, this is a UN-backed initiative. Um, they have, you know, 2,000 investors that report according to their standards, um, and, uh, and these investors manage in excess of 90 trillion pounds. And 
and what we're seeing and what, what actually we're very much involved with in um, at, uh, at GM&T is, um, you know, consumers are now very motivated by green credentials. You know, we're seeing uh, demand for, uh, you know, green tariffs on power and gas. Um, you know, customers are really interested in, in offsetting uh, those emissions. Um, and my well, final point here, the, the graph at the bottom um, regarding the voluntary carbon offset market. Um, this is something we're seeing, um, you know, many companies do now. Um, the emissions that are really hard to abate um, are, um, are, are being offset. But, but again, you know, it's not a significant enough size to make a difference. I mean, in 2019, only 100 million tons transacted uh, in voluntary carbon offsets. So it's still, you know, a very nascent market, but, um, but it's, it's certainly growing, as you can see from the chart, and it's uh, something we're all keeping an eye on. But that's, uh, that's it really, Jens. Sorry, I think that took a bit longer. Oh, not too long, definitely. Very interesting. I think it gave us a very good overview. Uh, and uh, I think we're ready to answer some questions based on that. So I really like to ask the audience to put some more questions into the Q&A. Um, I would start with one. Uh, you have given us this great overview on a global level of different kind of programs being in place. Uh, there are, let's say, emissions trading schemes, but there are as well tax regimes uh, in, in place. Do you have a view on that? Um, what will be at the end uh, prevail or what do you think is more effective? Yeah, that's an interesting interesting topic. I mean, the on the slide I put up about the you know the different um, schemes globally, there is pretty much a 50-50 split uh, mm -hmm. between trading schemes and taxes. And yeah, it, it's it's an ongoing debate. I think. The, I mean, I I'm a big believer of the EUTS, um, and so is Europe, for example. So this is. Obviously, you know something that the EU are pr promoting globally, and you have China backing it. Um, you know, we've got the, the the schemes in the US at the moment. So I think for for the sectors where you're talking about large scale emitters, um, the trading scheme is 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 very good because you can reduce emissions more efficiently. But then, obviously, you know it doesn't work everywhere. So I think both need to be part of the solution. It's kind of a trading infrastructure as well, which is not in place for many areas. Yeah, um, we have one question connected to that. If Biden wins, could there be a U.S.-wide ETS? Is that part of his plans? Um, I don't think so. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, the panel that I watched um, yesterday, there was a, there was an American lawmaker on there, mm -hmm. and um, there was no mention of a uh, of a U.S.-wide ETS, but more erring towards a tax, actually. Uh, for example, this well mouth tax that I mentioned. Yeah, um, yeah I think, well, we're, we're all kind of um, dreaming of maybe having sort of a, some sort of globally linked uh, ETS system, but I, I think that's, um, you know, many decades still uh, ahead of us. Yeah, but you, you, you see it as a trading topic, really. I mean, we see that, that many, as well, of the oil majors are setting up now environmental trading desks, and they are including even the, the, the voluntary carbon trading schemes or prices in, in, in trading. Um, what is the role of trading in this, in this, let's say, development we are seeing right now? Is there a positive contribution as well from trading activity? Because you, you mentioned as well that it may put more pressure on some of the markets if you have, let's say, hedge funds being active as well. Yeah, I mean, I, that's certainly the case for the EU ETS, I think. I mean, that market can, I didn't really think that would be possible a couple of years ago, but now it seems it's very squeezable. Um, you know, if someone decides to come in and trade uh, by 100 million tons, um, you know, we're off to the races. But I think definitely so on a, uh, on a sort of trading scheme level, obviously the more participants, the more liquidity, et cetera. And I think that sort of partially holds as well for the offsets. You know, one of the problems um, with the development of voluntary projects at the moment is um, there is very little price transparency. You now, ecosystem marketplace, they publish an, an annual report uh, on average prices and volumes traded, et cetera. But it's, uh, it's still very difficult for investors and buyers to really get a grasp of, uh, of kind of what's, what's really going on there and am I getting a good deal here? 
and you know the oil and gas majors you mentioned you know a lot of them have set their their own uh, some of them net zero targets by 2050 uh, others slightly different uh, so they obviously have that internal uh, internal need that they're mainly fulfilling um, but generally speaking also uh, setting up sort of trading desks to facilitate um, you know this increasing demand for uh, for offsets Maybe the, the trade is going to help as well, getting more transparency into the market and uh, as well some some standardization probably. Uh, uh, we hear always about yeah about the intransparency which still exists there. You know. I'd like to ask the audience to to have a few more questions. Um, still can we can still pick them up. So maybe focusing a little bit on, on the on the German scheme, which is which is in preparation right now. Um, there was a huge political debate about, about 25 euro, or do we start at 10, or where to start? Where where do you think, in a, in a European setting, for the example of Germany, is a is a price level where it starts to have some have some effects on abatement and investments? Do you have a certain level in mind? Well, it's. I think the if you look at the the price trajectory that that Germany wants to achieve, um, so sixty five euros by I believe twenty twenty five, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. I mean that's it sounds like a big number, but actually when you translate that into, uh, for example, the added price at the pump, um, it's it's really not yeah. that much. Um, I mean the, the as it starts next year uh, at twenty five euros per ton, the the expected added price at the pump is only something like seven euro cents per liter of petrol. Um, and, you know, ask yourself, is that going to stop you from buying a liter of petrol? <laughs> Not one, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it also, I mean, that it, there is an ambition to ultimately link this um, German ETS to the EU ETS. And I think there's a general need to, to kind of broaden uh, the sectors that are covered by the UTS, and I think it's it just sets a really interesting signal that uh, you know Germany are happy with a price at sixty five euros. Yep. Is that is that where Absolutely. we're heading? No, it's a strong signal at least. Uh, there's one question regarding the European ETS right now. Do you expect any impacts from from Brexit? How is Brexit affecting it? Yeah, Brexit is a is sort of a. I wish it would just go away. It's, it's been going on for years. Um, I think what what we are sort of seeing is, um, and my analysis suggests is, it's. I think it's going to have quite a minor impact actually, because the market has been prepared already for, you know, well over a year uh, for the fact that UK is not going to be part of the EU ETS from 2021 onwards. Yeah. And, um, and I think any kind of excess amount of EUAs, which was perhaps at some point around in UK installations is no longer there. You know, we, uh, this, this year uh, in April, we saw UK installations buying uh, and I expect the same to happen in, um, in April next year. And, and the fact actually that the UK is no longer in the UTS um, actually slightly reduces the supply into the UTS because the UK has actually done really well uh, reducing its emissions uh, from its baseline. So it's it's actually, it's a bit of a twisted topic that I wish yeah. would end. <laughs> yeah. we, we start a new area, era where we have, a, let's say, a neighbor who's most probably very aggressively thinking about an industrial policy uh, to, to attract industry and, and, uh, and growth. So uh, we will most probably see a competition around different systems being in place and uh, these border, border uh, yeah, just adjustments and stuff like that. That will be a very interesting phase, most probably as well. There will be a discussion between UK and, and Europe, don't don't you think so? Or definitely, definitely. Yeah. I mean, if if we just look at the just look at the ETS, um, yeah, they they do ultimately want to want to link, but but you know how yeah. that's going to work is uh, yeah, months of discussion away. Excellent. Do we have some more questions here? Um, let me check. We have answered these. Any more questions? Yeah. 
No, nothing yet. All right. There's one. Exactly. Here's a, one more question. Is there a chance that agriculture will be added to the EU ETS scheme? Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I haven't heard it be mentioned. Um, it's, it's one of the sectors that um, certainly needs to be covered, um, as I mentioned about the, uh, the polluting effects of, of, of cows. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know the answer to that, actually. Um, I, uh, I think, it, from a personal opinion, it's one of those sectors which is probably just going to get taxed. Um, but, but actually, internationally, um, agriculture, I think, is, has huge potential for developing um, offset projects. Um, and yes. it's, it's something that, uh, that we are looking very actively at. You mean looking at in terms of promoting these projects or so implementing well for yourself? Yeah. yeah, so so implementing projects um, with international partners where we're actually changing some of the processes um, mm -hmm. at farms um, that reduce emissions. Because sometimes it's it's something really simple, like uh, you know changing your you know your machinery or um, you know the time of year when you when you harvest or like there there are some really simple things you can do. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a little bit of perspective? I mean, you, you're sitting or you're, you're trading on the trading desk on the one side, on the other side, you are, you have as well, you're acting for one of the big players in the, in the markets. Do you have a double role there? And how do you see that playing out over the next years? <laughs> well, I think, well, that depends on how long I'm here for, I guess. But um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, yeah, the, the, the topic of, uh, of emissions, uh, for Gazprom is is one that I don't think is going to get solved um, over the next uh, you know couple of days at least. It's uh, it's very much a long term topic. I mean we are um, you know looking at uh, investing into hydrogen technology for example in Russia, um, but I think equally there's you know there's so much more um, that we need to do. We need to be prepared for you know potential border taxes on natural gas, um, all sorts of things, and so. Uh, you know the the, the growth um, within within Gazprom in this area is is, is going to be, be huge, and that's why I, you know I think it's great that we've now actually set up a dedicated team uh, looking at this. But um, you know on a day to day basis, you know our our big focus really is our our European customers, our um, our retail customers, and and servicing that demand really, and and that's what set us on this uh, on this most recent path uh, is, is consumer demand. Excellent. Great. Julia, ah, one more question here. Um, it adds on that. So I, I just hand it over. Does Gazprom have a carbon neutrality plan for, for the future? Is there something in place? It's, uh, it's one of those things that, you know, I would hope to be able to, to introduce at least the mm -hmm. concept of mm -hmm. uh, to the organization. I mean, we don't have the same sort of uh, pressures as some of the other oil and gas yeah. majors. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, I, I would say it's one of my, uh, one of my goals to, uh, to, you know, work together with, uh, w within the company to, uh, you know, to try and solve these issues. Great. Perfect. Julian, thank you very much. I think it was a super interesting talk. Um, uh, time was passing very quickly. Um, you said you were happy to answer additional questions afterwards, or we can channel them to you or via LinkedIn. I think there are different channels out there. So um, please feel free, everyone in the audience, to, to contact us. Um, with another session, we will be back in about two weeks, as always. Every second week, we come with a topic. Next time with us uh, will be um, Tobias Paulun from EX. We have an interesting talk there, definitely. First time in an exchange talking with us. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. But again, big thank you to you, Julia, for today's session. Uh, hope to talk to you soon again. Bye-bye. Thanks to you as well, Jens. Cheers.